APCO Basic Science Topic Gestational Trophoblastic Disease Gestational trophoblastic disease is a group of benign disorders with abnormal trophoblast proliferation from the placenta. Lesions arise from fetal tissue rather than maternal tissue. This includes molar pregnancies, also known as hydatidiform moles, both complete and partial, as well as benign non-neoplastic lesions, including placental site nodules. Women with molar pregnancies are at risk of developing malignant disorders known as gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. GTN includes invasive moles and nonmolar neoplasms, including choriocarcinoma, placental site trophoblastic tumor, and epithelioid trophoblastic tumors. The objectives of this video are to understand the physiologic stages of fertilization, understand the pathogenesis of complete and partial molar pregnancy, describe the histopathology and differences in morphology of complete and partial molar pregnancy, and discuss potential of malignant sequelae from pregnancy. To review clinical diagnosis and management of gestational trophoblastic disease, please review the APCO clinical education topic 50. Let's meet our patient. She is a 20-year-old Gravida 1 who is 10 weeks pregnant by her last menstrual period. She has been having light bleeding over the last three days. Her pregnancy has otherwise been complicated by nausea and vomiting. Her uterus feels larger than expected on bimanual exam, measuring about 12 weeks. You complete an ultrasound as seen here. Labeled is the uterus. Her ultrasound demonstrates a classic snowstorm pattern. You discuss with her your concern for a complete molar pregnancy. You obtain some blood work and her beta HCG level is very high. Free T4 is slightly elevated and TSH is decreased. Let's pause, read, and apply. What causes hyperthyroidism in molar pregnancy? Thyrotropin-like effects of beta-HCG can cause an increase in free T4, although it is rare for lab values to be outside the normal range. The HCG molecule is similar in structure to the TSH molecule, with the same alpha subunits. Because of the similar structures, HCG can act directly on TSH receptors, resulting in increased level of thyroid hormones and decreased TSH levels. She asks, how did this happen? To fully understand the pathophysiology of molar pregnancy, it is first important to understand how normal fertilization occurs. After ovulation, the unfertilized egg is arrested in metaphase and meiosis II. As sperm travel up the female reproductive tract, they undergo capacitation, a series of changes in the sperm plasma membrane that increase its affinity for the oocyte. This is a fallopian tube. Labeled here is the infundibulum, the ampulla, and the isthmus. Only a small fraction, 0.002% of sperm, reach the ampulla of the tube, where fertilization typically occurs. Here, the zona pellucida is in pink around the oocyte. The zona pellucida is a glycoprotein layer surrounding the oocyte. The sperm head binds to the zona pellucida within 24 to 48 hours of ovulation in the fallopian tube. The sperm binds to ZP3 receptors on the glycoprotein layer. Remember this receptor, we will come back to this. After binding the receptor, this triggers the acrosome reaction, in which hydrolytic enzymes such as acrosin are released at the head of the sperm. These enzymes penetrate the zona pellucida, allowing for the cell membranes of the sperm and egg to fuse. The sperm nucleus and cytoplasm are released into the egg. The haploid nucleus from the sperm undergoes decondensation, becoming the male pronucleus. At this point, completion of the second meiotic division occurs, producing a female pronucleus of the haploid ovum, and male and female pronucleus fuse to form a zygote. After one sperm enters, there are mechanisms in place to prevent polyspermy, when more than one sperm fertilizes an egg. One mechanism is the depolarization of the egg cell membrane. Ion channels open on the egg membrane, and the potential across the membrane changes from minus 70 to plus 10 millivolts. This works for a short time to repel other sperm electrostatically. In addition, the cortical reaction occurs, which is more of a slow block. The cortical reaction is a process initiated during fertilization by the release of cortical granules from the egg. A wave of calcium ions is released from the point of sperm entry. This induces cortical granules in the egg to release their contents. Polysaccharides in the cortical granules reach the outside of the egg and cover the zona pellucida to form a physical barrier to sperm. In addition, enzymes in the granules break down ZP3 receptors and further harden the coat. 
In partial molar pregnancies, dyspermia occurs, with two sperm fertilizing an egg. As seen here, two paternal haploid sets of chromosomes and one maternal haploid set fuse, resulting in triploid 69XXY, XXX, or rarely XYY karyotype. On ultrasound, there is typically a thickened hydrophic placenta with a concomitant fetus. Here is another image of a partial mole with a hydrophic appearing placenta. The coexisting fetus present with a partial mole is non-viable and typically has multiple male formations with abnormal growth. Microscopically, fetal tissue is present. To review, trophoblasts are the outer cells of a blastocyst and differentiate into the chorion or the fetal part of the placenta. Chorionic villi are finger-like projections from the chorion and allows for diffusion between the fetal and maternal blood. In partial molar pregnancies, there is a mixture of normal villi, seen in the center of the slide circled in red, and hydropic villi, labeled with an asterisk. You can also have exaggerated implantation site trophoblasts. On higher power, you can also see that there is trophoblastic proliferation between the villi. For a complete molar pregnancy, like in our patient, the chromosomes of the ovum are absent or inactivated. Haploid sperm duplicates its own chromosomes after meiosis known as androgenesis. Both sets of chromosomes are paternal. 85 to 90 percent of the time, the karyotype is 46XX. There is no fetal tissue, and it grossly appears like clear vesicles, or a cluster of grapes. On ultrasound, as in our patient, a snowstorm pattern is typical. Large ovarian cysts, known as thecaludian cysts, may also be seen. Picture is an ovary. These cysts are labeled with a blue arrow and develop with prolonged exposure to luteinizing hormone or beta-HCG. Microscopically, these moles have swollen enlarged hydropic villi, with cistern formation consistent with central cavitation within the large villi. On higher power, you can see abnormal trophoblastic proliferation surrounding the hydropic villi. Now that you understand the pathophysiology, you can discuss next steps with our patient. You recommend a suction dilation and curettage for treatment, which confirms the diagnosis of a complete mole. Following the procedure, she gets serial beta-HCG levels on a weekly basis. Once her beta-HCG normalizes, you recommend that she continue to have monthly beta-HCG levels drawn. Let's pause, read, and apply. Why is it important to obtain serial beta-HCG levels in women following treatment for molar pregnancy? Women with molar pregnancies have an increased risk of developing gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. The incidence of GTN following a complete mole is 15 to 20 percent, and the risk following a partial mole is 1 to 5 percent. As mentioned previously, GTN encompasses invasive moles, choriocarcinoma, as well as rare placental site trophoblastic tumors and epithelioid trophoblastic tumors. They are characterized by aggressive invasion of the endometrium and myometrium by trophoblast cells. While histology types have been characterized, tissue is not often attained for pathology. Instead, GTN is diagnosed based on elevated beta-HCG levels and managed clinically. Approximately 50% of cases of GTN arise from molar pregnancy, 25% from miscarriage or ectopic, and 25% from term or preterm pregnancy. Choriocarcinomas originating from complete molar gestations account for the most cases of metastatic disease. The most common site of spread are the lungs, in which 80% of women with metastatic disease will have disease to the lungs, 30% of women will have metastatic disease to the vagina, 20% to the pelvis, 10% to the liver, and 10% to the brain. Pelvic ultrasonography and chest x-ray are ordered to assess for metastasis. If there is evidence of metastatic disease, CT of the abdomen and pelvis as well as MRI or CT of the brain should be ordered. Biopsy should be avoided since GTN tissue is highly vascular. Treatment of GTN is primarily with chemotherapy. Hysterectomy is also a treatment modality in cases of women with disease confined to the uterus who do not desire future fertility. GTN of the brain can be treated with radiation therapy and is an emergent procedure. This concludes the APCO Basic Science video on gestational trophoblastic disease. In this video, we reviewed the physiologic stages of fertilization, the histopathology and pathogenesis of complete and partial molar pregnancies, and the potential for malignant sequelae from pregnancies.